Good afternoon. My name is Layla Durstein, and I serve as Director of Alumni Engagement Programs. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to Williams Reunion Weekend uh, and to introduce today's speaker, Williams Associate Professor of Psychology, Jeremy Cohn. Professor Cohn received his PhD in social psychology from Cornell in 2012, and after completing a postdoc at Yale University, he joined the Williams faculty in 2015. Jeremy's research focuses on the science of first impressions, especially the nature and operation of implicit processes, including impression formation and updating intuitive decision making and the nature of empathic responding. He'll explain what that means, I'm sure. His work has been published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Psychological Science, and Journal of Experimental Psychology General. He has also been featured in the New York Times, NPR, CNN, Business Perspectives, and Scientific American. Today, Professor Cohn will discuss the different facets of empathy and the ways in which disentangling empathy can help provide us with a more nuanced understanding of others' inner emotional lives. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end of the program. Please note that we are recording today's session, so if you do ask a question, you'll be part of the recording in perpetuity. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Cohn to the stage. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for uh, coming to this uh, talk. Uh, I'm really excited to present this research to you because uh, I think of all of the work that I've done at Williams since I arrived here, this is one of the projects that I'm most proud of. And part of the reason for that is because it began as an honors thesis project uh, that was completed by Ananya. She was one of my first thesis students uh, after I arrived at Williams. Um, and none of the topics that I will present to you today are ones that my lab was studying prior to her arrival. And so all of the ideas that I'll present to you really germinated in those early conversations that we had as part of her senior uh, year, sort of developing ideas for this thesis and bouncing ideas off of one another. Um, and then arriving at the studies that I'll present to you today. Um, and then Issa sort of took the reins from Ananya in the summer science program just about to begin uh, next week. Uh, a few years ago, she participated in that program and essentially pushed this, pro uh, this project across the finish line. Um, and the result of that was uh, this publication between the three of us in uh, Journal of Experimental Psychology General, which I'll tell you about today. Um, OK. so. Uh, the question that we're interested in trying to understand here is what is it that allows us to get an accurate window into another person's in, inner mental life? Both understanding their thoughts, but also especially their feelings, uh, recognizing the emotions that they are experiencing. Some of us are very apt at reading those very subtle nonverbal cues that leak out of us that can indicate whether we are distressed or upset or angry or frustrated, or for that matter, happy or satisfied or proud. And for others of us, a little bit less so. Those cues seem to fly under the radar and we develop misperceptions of other people's inner mental lives in ways that can have consequences for our interactions with them. And so what we'd like to try to understand in this work is sort of understanding that variability. What is it that makes somebody accurate or inaccurate? And in particular, are there some sort of enduring dispositional sorts of traits uh, or tendencies that we may have that can make us better able to do this in a more enduring and reliable sort of way? So to give you an idea of what we mean by that, let me show you one of the tasks that participants in our studies faced, now completed by well over 1,000 participants. And so what you're about to see is a recording of a person who was asked to engage in a kind of mock interview, answering questions like, what are your greatest strengths and weaknesses, or where do you think you're going to be in 10 years from now? Um, and during that interview, you'll, see, you'll hear a whole series of those kinds of responses. But then after this was completed, the participant was asked to answer a series of questions about the emotions that they were experiencing during the interview. So how anxious were you, or how jittery were you, or how distressed were you, or how proud were you, or engaged, or 
interested. And what I'd like you to try to do is to guess the answers that this person gave. Now, to be clear, this is not a real participant. This is my research assistant, Allison, demonstrating the procedure for ethical reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, try to guess what you think emotions, uh, you think the emotions were that she was I think my strength is, is my organizational skills. I think I'm really good at pulling a group of people together and delegating tasks to them and like planning events and, and things like that. Okay, so that's an identical sort of stimulus to the ones that many of our participants completed, although they were a, quite a bit longer than that. They averaged uh, uh, sort of several minutes in duration. Uh, now the question is, what do you think Allison was feeling? How interested do you think she was? Or how distressed do you think she was? Or how excited or determined or active or jittery or attentive? Um, and not just whether you think she was experiencing those things, but what intensity do you think she was experiencing those emotions on a sort of zero to four scale? And having administered this kind of task to now hundreds of participants, you, what we find is that there are many people in our sample who are astoundingly accurate and very apt at reading those cues in ways that predict exactly what the participants themselves said. And at the same time, we also have a number of participants who are wildly off the mark, uh, who just have an inability to read whatever those cues may be uh, when they're not provided in some sort of verbal way. And so we want to try to explain that variation and try to understand what is it about those people that seem to be most successful that allows them to engage in this kind of task. Um, and so one intuition that you may have about one of the most uh, prominent or pro like likely sort of candidates for a trait that may make you particularly apt at this skill is empathy. Um, and so uh, John Steinbeck writes in East of Eden, you can only understand people if you feel them in yourself. And the idea there is that perhaps if we, uh, if we don't just merely sort of observe people from afar in this kind of cold or rational sort of way, but really make an effort to step into their emotional shoes and really feel the things that that person is feeling, maybe that's what gives us a glimpse into what another person is experiencing in some sort of way. And so that was the question where we started this project, was to understand what is the relationship between trait empathy and uh, interpersonal accuracy. And I, to be clear, I mean that at the level of a kind of dispositional trait. That is, some of us have a tendency to be more strongly empathic towards others, others of us a little bit less so, and trying to understand whether there are stable and robust relationships between those things. And one of the uh, most interesting fa uh, uh, elements of this literature on the relationship between interpersonal accuracy and empathy is just how mixed the evidence really is. And in fact, this is more generally too not true, not just of empathy itself, but also about interpersonal accuracy. There have been many, many attempts to try to understand what are the properties that make someone a good judge. And the evidence for that has been decidedly mixed. There really haven't been any strong examples of any kind of stable, robust predictors that can tell you whether a person will or will not be a good judge. We have examples in the literature of places where that's true, where people find positive relationships between a particular trait and the levels of accuracy that you might show on one of these tasks. But for every example of that, we have uh, another study that shows either no relationship or uh, a negative relationship between them. And empathy is not immune to this kind of uh, challenging sort of mixed evidence. It turns out that there is some evidence, there have been some prominent studies that have suggested that um, empathy is uh, positively related to people's abilities in this domain. But there are also examples uh, that have found no relationship. And in fact, many of those are actually attempts to replicate previous work that has shown a positive relationship. And there have even been examples of places where there is a negative relationship, meaning that empathy in some ways may be detrimental to your accuracy when trying to read someone else's emotions. Um, and this has led some in the area of interpersonal accuracy, researchers studying this question, to suggest that maybe we should abandon a search for good judges altogether. Maybe that isn't what explains whether a person is going to be accurate or not. It's not about some sort of stable dispositional tendency that we have. It's rather more better explained by situational variance, that is, features of the situation that make us better able to read another person's emotions uh, or make, us, make it so that it's very difficult to do that um, in ways that can sort of eliminate any sort of stable variability that you might imagine.
Our proposal is that it may be premature to abandon the idea that there are good judges, at least with respect to trait empathy. Because our proposal is that when we think about empathy as a kind of psychological construct, one of the things that's happened in this literature is that there's a huge amount of conceptual lack of clarity about exactly what we mean by empathy. And we know that it's a very complicated, multifaceted kind of set of skills that are interrelated with one another. And as a result of that lack of conceptual clarity, it may be worth it for us to try to disentangle each of those different facets of empathy to understand each of their unique contributions to interpersonal accuracy. And in particular, what I'd like to propose to you is that there are some ways in which we might think of as sort of quintessential empathy that are beneficial in a stable and robust way for our ability to understand someone else. But there are also components that are detrimental. And to the extent that we lump these things together, what that does is it serves to cancel each of these contributions out. And so what we want to do is to disentangle those components and understand each of their independent contributions to uh, interpersonal accuracy. Before I continue, though, it's worth it to appreciate exactly how much lack of clarity there has been in this literature. Um, and so when we think about empathy, it's, it's not always clear exactly what we mean by that. And researchers have not been immune to those kinds of uh, sort of ambiguity of the definitions that we might use. In fact, a very recent investigation of the literature, the research on empathy, has suggested that researchers have used up to 43 different definitions of what counts as empathy or not that vary along eight totally distinct and independent dimensions. And so there's, uh, there's clearly a lot of disagreement about exactly what counts or what we mean by that. But at the same time, we've known for a long time that empathy is this kind of multifaceted sort of skill set that has a variety of different components associated with it. And one of the most important distinctions that I want to latch on to is uh, the question of how much of empathy is a kind of affective reaction that we have towards somebody versus how much of that is a kind of cognitive reaction that we have towards somebody in terms of attempting to take their perspective. Or another way to think about that is how much is empathy a kind of self-oriented sort of experience in which we experience emotions as a result of observing other people's emotional experience versus how much of that is a kind of other-oriented experience in which we see someone experience something but then we have a different kind of emotional reaction, maybe something closer to sympathy or compassion or care or concern. Um, and so this kind of distinction um, is a very important one because it has different psychological consequences. So one of those we can think of as a kind of affective mirroring. So I see somebody in distress and I can't help sort of automatically I experience distress as well. And that might motivate me to try to alleviate their distress as a way to also resolve my own. We might call that a kind of contagion, a kind of empathic contagion in which I catch the emotions of other people. But on the other hand, we can think of uh, uh, another other-oriented sort of emotional experience that we might call uh, empathic concern or care. And in this case, I don't necessarily mirror the other emotions of the other person, but rather I respond to it either emotionally or cognitively. So now I see somebody in distress, I don't experience distress myself. I don't mirror that response. Instead, I feel a sense of like tender care or concern or compassion or sympathy for them in ways that might also motivate action to try to help them, but not through my own resolution of my own distress. And we might also think of that as a kind of more cognitive kind of perspective taking where I don't necessarily experience the emotions of the other person, but rather I just try to step into their shoes and understand in some sort of cognitive way what they might be experiencing. And importantly, in some recent work, if we look at those tendencies at the dispositional level, what some research has suggested is that they are psychologically distinct. That is, the people who happen to catch the emotions of others who are very high in empathic contagion are not necessarily the same people as those who are more likely to more cognitively take the perspective of somebody else uh, or to experience sympathy or compassion for them. And so we wanted to try to understand how these different components, if we separate them out, might make different contributions to your ability to understand uh, someone else's experience. 
Before we get there, though, another really important point of conceptual confusion in this literature is that we can think of empathy both as a state and as a trait. If we think about that at the trait level, what I mean by that is that there are stable, robust differences between people in terms of the extent to which they empathize regularly with others. And that could be at the level of contagion or at the level of concern. Some of us regularly have those kinds of emotional reactions, others less so, in a kind of stable and robust way uh, in which we have variation among us. If we think about that at the trait level, that might make certain predictions about uh, its relationship to a whole variety of psychological constructs that could differ from thinking about empathy at the level of state, because we also know that independent of wherever you sit on these dimensions in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of stable or robust dispositional tendencies, we also have the tendency to have, in a moment, empathy towards someone or not. And those responses can change over time. And there are a variety of different situational factors that might matter, whether a person is part of our in-group or our out-group, uh, how similar they are to us, whether we're busy, whether we're cognitively taxed, whatever those things might be, that can make it so that we just have a failure of empathy in the moment, independent of what those contributions will be. Uh, or whatever our sort of more stable tendencies might be. And so I just want to be clear that I'm looking at this at the trait level. I'm not necessarily thinking about this at the state level. And whatever patterns I show you today, it's not necessarily the case that we should expect the same things to, uh, to emerge when we change our level of analysis. So if we thought about this at the state level, we might arrive at different ideas. Okay, so I'll present to you a series of studies that all have a very similar sort of structure to them. So I'll present them all to you simultaneously. Um, and so our task was basically to evaluate each of these different facets of empathy using a variety of different dispositional sorts of uh, tendencies uh, on self-report scales. Um, and then to, in various flavors and capacities, I'll show you a whole variety of these different kinds of measures, to assess people's interpersonal accuracy. Um, and I ha we did that with uh, something called the reading the mind and the eyes test, the RMAT, um, which I'll show you in a second. The diagnostic analysis of nonverbal affect, both at the level of facial expressions and at the level of voice or audio. And the interview paradigm that you saw earlier. Um, and so all of these studies have a very similar sort of flavor, but they vary the measure of interpersonal accuracy. We also uh, varied the sample to uh, recruit, at least in one study, a representative US sample so that we could show that the results generalize um, to uh, the, all of the US. <coughs> OK, so our first task was to measure uh, each of these different facets of empathy. So here are a set of measurements that we collected that capture people's dispositional tendencies towards experiencing contagion. And there were a series of different measurements and different subscales, all of which it turned out are highly intercorrelated. So see where you sit on these dimensions. So the first scale is called personal distress. And this includes items like, in emergency situations, I feel apprehensive and ill at ease. I sometimes feel helpless when I'm in the middle of a, a very emotional situation. When I see someone get hurt, I tend to remain calm, reverse scored, of course. Being in a tense emotional situation scares me, uh, et cetera. There were a total of seven items in this measurement. So notice that these are kind of an inescapable sort of distress that you experience when you face certain sorts of uh, situations. Uh, this is another version of a scale that was also very intercorrelated on the contagion dimension. Um, and this is a set of items reflecting a kind of contagion of emotion. So this is what's called the empathy index. It includes items like this. If I see someone who is excited, I will feel excited myself. If I'm watching a movie and a character injures their leg, I will feel pain in my leg. If I hear an awkward story about someone else, I might feel a little embarrassed. If I see someone fidgeting, I'll start feeling anxious too. And so notice that this is a kind of inescapable, sort of automatic sort of catching of other people's emotional experiences, kind of affective mirroring. And then the final scale was looking at behavioral contagion. So now no longer catching emotions, but catching actions. This includes things like, if I see someone vomit, I will also gag. I catch myself crossing my arms or legs just like the person I'm talking to. If I see a video of a baby smiling, I find myself smiling. If I'm watching someone walking on a balance beam, I will lean when they lean, et cetera. 
Um, and so uh, it turns out that all three of these subscales were highly intercorrelated, and so we put those all into a single index of a person's levels of contagion. Okay, then we also wanted to measure factors related to this other-oriented kind of concern or care for someone else, and that include two, uh, included two different scales. One of those was focused on a more cognitive perspective taking of another person, so here are items related to that. I try to look at everybody's side of a disagreement before I make a decision. I sometimes try to understand my friends better by imagining how things look from their perspective. I believe that there are two sides to every equation, uh, every question, and I try to look at them both. When I'm upset at someone, I, try, uh, I usually try to put myself in his shoes for a, uh, his or her shoes for a, a while, et cetera. And uh, so notice that these are more of a cognitive attempt to just recognize that other people have different perspectives um, and trying to put yourself into those shoes and understand them, not in an emotional way necessarily, but it could be if you wanted it to be. Um, and then we also have a set of items more tapping into concern. Um, and these are things like, I often have tender concern feelings for people less fortunate than me. When I see someone being taken advantage of, I feel, a kind, uh, I feel kind of protective towards them. Other people's misfortunes do not d usually disturb me a great deal. Um, I am often quite touched by the things that I see happen, et cetera. And it turns out again, in this case, that the perspective taking measure and the empathic concern measure were actually highly intercorrelated with one another. And so we combine those into a single index of concern. Okay, so now over each of these studies, we use a different example of interpersonal accuracy, all of which have been drawn from uh, the literature and have been very well validated and have had a whole uh, series of demonstrations of their psychological properties and consequences. So the first of these was the reading the mind and the eyes test. Uh, here's what happens here. You see uh, eyes that have been cropped on a face and your task is to tell me whether you think that this person is jealous, panicked, arrogant, or hateful. And the way that we get the correct answers to these questions is the, uh, essentially by consensus. So what, uh, the, in the original paper, they recruited a, a large set of participants to respond to these. And there were very clear consensus answers for each of them. And then we code pe uh, people's answers for whether they give the consensus answer or not. Here's another one. Is this person joking, insisting, amused, relaxed? Aghast, fantasizing, impatient, alarmed. Okay, and it has a total of 24 items on it um, that has, again, been well validated and used in a whole variety of other research. Uh, in another set of uh, studies, we use the diagnostic analysis of nonverbal affect, and there are two versions of it. Here's the first version. Uh, so what you do is you see a face, um, and this is an actor who has been asked to portray a particular emotion, um, and those, uh, that actor was asked to do this either in a very subtle way or in a very obvious way, and both of those items are included in the measure. Um, and so now the question is, is this person happy, sad, angry, or fearful? Does that person look happy, sad, angry, or fearful? It's always the same stems for these. And there are correct answers for them. Um, OK, and then in another set, we uh, use the voice version of the Danva. And so the way that that works is you're about to hear an audio clip. And it's the same setup. The, it, it's, it's an actor who was asked to portray a particular emotion in their reading. And your task is to tell me which emotion it is. So let's try some of these together. Number two. I'm going out of the room now. And I'll be back later. OK, so was that person happy, sad, angry, or fearful? Here's another. Number 13. I'm going out of the room now, and I'll be back later. OK, and here's another. Number 18. I am going out of the room now, and I'll be back later. OK, and so there's, uh, again, there's correct answers for these, and so we can score them out of uh, 24. OK, and then the final paradigm was the one that you saw earlier that you were asked to do at the top of the talk. Um, and so what happens here is we actually recruited a set of Williams undergraduates to participate in a set of mock interviews. And a total of 14 undergraduates uh, uh, were videos, uh, their videos were selected to be the targets of the judgments. Um, so each participant that participated in the judgment were given a random video out of the 14. And of course, what that means is that the answers to these questions change depending on which participant's video you saw, because those participants actually answered the questions about how they felt afterwards. And then uh, we have these 20 items that we asked them to complete. <laughs>
And then we take the participants' actual answers, and we take the, uh, the target or the perceiver's guesses about what those answers are, and we calculate a raw difference between them. So if the person actually felt three and the perceiver guesses two, you would have one unit of empathic error. And then we sum that across all 20 of the items. And so what that gives us is a measurement of the raw level of empathic error between the person's self-judgment and their guesses about what the person is feeling. OK, so now what I'll show you are a series of regressions that assess the relationship between these variables. And so we uh, had a series of different models that we used to assess the relationships between them. Uh, the first of these just looked at the direct contributions of each of these different components of empathy to empathic accuracy. So these values that you see here are unstandardized betas. So what they represent is the uh, overall number of units of change on the uh, empathic accuracy measure for each one unit change uh, for each of the predictors. So for example, if we look here, just direct your attention to the, oh, this isn't, okay. Uh, direct your attention to the second row there. What you can see is that concern has a positive contribution to people's levels of accuracy on each of these measures. So for each unit increase in empathic concern, you get about three additional points in your score on the um, RMET. And importantly, if you look to that very end of the second row, you'll notice that the value now becomes negative, and that is because that value is representing empathic error now. And so what that shows to you is that as you have increases in your levels of empathic concern, you have decreases in your raw levels of error in your assessment of the other person's emotions. So really, really stable pattern across all of those different uh, uh, interpersonal accuracy measures. But importantly, if you look at the first row, looking at contagion, you'll see that the pattern is in the opposite direction. As your levels of contagion increase, your score on each of these measures of interpersonal accuracy decreases. It is detrimental to your performance on all of these different measures. And again, if you look at empathic error on the very right, you'll see that you're increasing your levels of error as your levels of contagion go up. And what that shows us is that each of these different components make opposing contributions to your ability to read accurately the emotions out of these video clips or out of these audio clips or out of these still images of facial expressions or uh, cropped, uh, cropped eyes, et cetera. And so um, that's showing us that if you were to think of these items and lump them all together, then what would happen is it would cancel out and you would, you would seem to have discovered that there's no relationship between those things. But separating them out shows us that they're actually making these opposing contributions. And what's uh, particularly interesting about this result is that, like has been found in past work, we also found that these two components, uh, that is contagion and concern, truly are psychologically distinct. The correlation between them is functionally zero. And so that shows us that people who are high in contagion are not necessarily the people who are high in concern. And so to the extent that you, that, that essentially means that you can be having either one of these especially strongly uh, or both of them or neither of them. Um, and what we're seeing is that you sort of get this kind of opposing relationship between them. We also had another model where we looked at the interaction between these two psychologically distinct components, and we find consistent evidence for an interaction between the two of them as well. And so I'll show you what that looks like now just depicted visually. Um, and so uh, if you look on the left side, you're looking at changes in the levels of empathic concern along the x-axis, and you're looking at how that predicts people's scores and in interpersonal accuracy on the y-axis. And then I'll show you what that looks like for low levels of contagion, that is one standard deviation below the mean, the mean, or one standard deviation above the mean. And these are all the predictive values from the regression. And what you can see is something really interesting, which is that if you have very low levels of concern, then what happens is your uh, levels of contagion are highly predictive of your score on the interpersonal accuracy measure. So if you look on the very left of that figure, you can see that if you have very low contagion, you get a pretty high score. If you have average, you get a much lower score. If you have very high, you get a much lower score. 
that shows us that it's detrimental, essentially. But as you have increasing levels of empathic concern, what that does is it serves to eliminate that detrimental effect. And so notice that if you max out on this empathic concern scale or this perspective-taking scale, then it doesn't matter anymore what your contagion score was. You still get a high score independent of that. And so it shows us that there's a kind of protective effect of that um, high levels of that empathic concern. And if you look at the empathic error measurement, that is the interview paradigm, what you see is the reverse pattern, which is exactly what we pr would predict because these are now measuring error instead of accuracy. And it, the same pattern emerges, which is basically if you have very low levels of concern, contagion predicts very high levels of error, but those uh, patterns get eliminated as you have higher and higher levels of uh, empathic concern. Okay, so it turns out that these patterns are uh, also robust to two stable predictors of interpersonal accuracy. One of those is gender, and another of those is age. It turns out that both of those uh, uh, demographic characteristics are related to people's uh, uh, empathic accuracy, um, with uh, women scoring, uh, tending to score higher on these types of measures relative to men and uh, age uh, pre negatively predicting. So as we get older, we tend to get, score slightly worse on these measures. Those, turned, those patterns turned out to emerge in our data as well, but importantly, controlling for them doesn't affect any of the relationships that we see with empathy, so that we get the same patterns there. The other thing that was very noteworthy is just how stable and consistent the results were. So uh, remember that I was lumping all of these uh, factors together related to contagion and related to concern, but any uh, individual subscale showed an identical pattern to the larger composite. So if you look across that uh, first column there, you'll see that uh, essentially all of the subscales predict in the same direction. So for factor one contagion, empathy and behavioral contagion and personal distress all show negative relationships that are very robust. And if you look at concern, they're all positive. So this shows us that it isn't any one particular ability. It's not any one particular scale that seems to drive these patterns. They all seem to be interrelated in the ways that we would expect. And this was true for all of our studies. They all show these kinds of patterns. Okay, so why might this be? Why do we get these kinds of opposing relationships? Why would it be that people who are higher in empathic concern would, be, uh, would uh, have a beneficial sort of contribution to interpersonal accuracy? And why would contagion be detrimental? And uh, to start to answer that question, one of the things that we started to think about was how the decision-making styles of people who are high versus low on each of these traits may systematically vary. So one of the things that we know about emotion recognition in particular is that paradoxically, it turns out that the more rational you are, the more likely you are to be accurate. It might seem to us that the way that you get to someone's emotional experience is through a kind of intuition that you have, but it turns out that there's a very robust pattern with rational sort of judgment. And part of the reason why that's true is because uh, the more rational you are, the more that you deliberate about your sort of solving this problem, this judgment of understanding what the emotion uh, that the other person might be experiencing, the more that you tend to correct for whatever your own individual biases may be. It turns out that one of the strategies that we use to solve this kind of perspective-taking problem is that we first try to imagine what we might experience in that particular situation, or we anchor on our own individual perspective, and then we subsequently effortfully correct for whatever differences exist between our perspectives. And to the extent that you have a motivation to engage in that kind of effortful correction, you're much more likely to get the correct answer, at least to the extent to which our experiences, our emotional experiences, will differ. So just to think about what that means, for example, in the context of the interview paradigm. If I was to ask you, how do you think you would feel in the context of the interview paradigm, you might say, well, I would be really nervous. And then you say, oh, but wait a minute, that's not the same person. They're different from me. They might have a different answer. Let me think about whether there are reasons to imagine that that person's experience could be different from mine. 
So to the extent that I anchor on my own initial ideas about that, I might be inclined to get it wrong. So to investigate this, we first sought to try to look at whether there are unique patterns or systematic patterns uh, that emerge for people who have different ways of empathizing with others in terms of their decision-making style. And so the setup here is basically identical to what we did before, except now we're also going to assess people's tendencies towards making decisions rationally versus intuitively. Um, and to do that, we just used a standard measure called the Rational Experiential Inventory, or REI. Um, and here are some items from it. We asked people, how much do you enjoy intellectual challenges? Or, I enjoy solving problems that require hard thinking. I believe in trusting my hunches. I often go by my instincts when deciding on a course of action, etc. There were a total of 40 items here, 20 of which are related to rational or preference for rational judgment. 20 of which are related to preference for intuitive sorts of judgments. And so we can get a measurement for each subject in terms of how rational are they and how intuitive are they. And importantly, it turns out that people can be both. They're negatively related, but you can feel like rationality can help you, but also feel like intuition is valuable sometimes as well. So we can capture each of these tendencies individually, independently. And then we just looked at the relationship between these different ways of empathizing and interpersonal accuracy, as well as these decision-making styles. And so what you can see, first of all, is if we look at contagion, notice that they have a negative relationship with rationality. And what that means is that as you are more and more inclined to catch the emotions or the behaviors of another person, the less inclined you are to make, broadly speaking, decisions in terms of rational sorts of calculations. And the less you're likely to endorse thinking, um, uh, wanting to think very carefully about problems. You'll also notice that it has a positive relationship, although a mild one, to experientiality or intuitive sorts of decision-making tendencies. Um, and that shows us that, again, as you acquire these, like, you catch the emotions of other people, the more inclined you are to do that, the more you are to say that I like to trust my intuition, and I think that it's a good, reliable source of information. And importantly, just as has been found in past work, you'll notice that the relationship between rationality and emotion recognition is highly positive. The more rational our subjects were, the more likely they were to get the correct answer on the, in this case, the reading the mind and the eyes test. And so what this shows you is that one of the reasons why we might be seeing that contagion is detrimental to people's performance on these kinds of measures um, is because of this decision-making tendency to be less inclined to rely on rational judgment. But that turns out to be the thing that you need in order to be able to do this task well. For concern, we see the opposing pattern. The more that you show empathic concern, the more inclined you are to suggest that rationality is a good way to make choices. And also notice that it's got a positive connection to experientiality, which is also interesting. Notice that that's suggesting that these, part these participants say that both of these ways of making choices are potentially useful. Um, but importantly, the thing that really matters for your um, interpersonal accuracy is this rationality component. We don't see as much of a relationship between experientiality and um, emotion recognition. Okay, so that gives us one answer to this question, is that we see these systematic differences in people's uh, tendencies towards different kinds of decision-making styles. In this study, uh, what we wanted to do was to look at sort of getting a more fine-grained understanding about exactly how much people are relying upon their own imagined sorts of thoughts, sorry, uh, own imagined sorts of thoughts, uh, about how they would feel in a particular situation and sort of projecting those onto the other person. Um, and so to the extent that you do that and the other person has differences in your experiences, then we should expect that you're more likely to get it wrong as a result. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, so uh, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, this has been a very, very well-developed sort of theory about how perspective taking happens. Um, and so the idea is what we call egocentric anchoring and adjustment. And so what happens when we make an attempt to understand another person's perspective is that we start from our own perspective and then we systematically adjust or correct for changes between our perspective and theirs. So what happens in this study is uh, you'll notice that we have these cubbies. 
And on the left side, what you can see is what the participant is able to see. And notice that there are some occlusions. There's some, uh, some of the cubbies have been covered. And there is a director who is sitting on the other side of the cubbies. And notice that what those occlusions do is they make it so that you can't see some of the objects. So the director's view is just the reversal. It's just the other side of the cubbies. Um, and so you can see that those occlusions make it so that, for example, you can't see that tiny truck on the right in the, in the participant's view. And so the director is tasked with giving you a set of instructions to execute. So they might say, please move the small truck above the glue. And so notice that what that means from the director's perspective, the director's perspective is the right-hand side, right? Notice that what they must mean is the, the medium-sized truck there on the right, that, from the perspective of the director, is the small truck, right? There's only two trucks in the director's view, so it must be that one on the right. But from the participant's perspective, you'll notice that there's another even smaller truck that is located on the right-hand side there, and that is occluded. So we know that the director can't see it, but your first thought when you hear the word small truck, if you use your own egocentric perspective, would be to rely upon that truck. And so what we can do is we can look at the extent to which you make mistakes in this paradigm and also how long it takes you to execute the instruction as a function of whether there are differences between your perspective and the other person's perspective. So we might start this task by looking at it and saying, please move the small truck. OK, I'm looking at the occluded, very tiny truck. I say, wait a minute, it can't be that one. They must mean the other one that they're able to see. And so I start by looking at my own perspective, and then I adjust or correct for the fact that that can't be the one that the director means because their perspective is different. And then what we can do is we can put an eye tracker on you, and we can look at where you look in the display and sort of capture the time course of that as it unfolds. And so notice that the, the small truck from your perspective looks like uh, the purple guy there, but it's occluded on the other side. Here's another example. Please move the, blue, uh, the mouse below the yogurt. Notice that there's a computer mouse from your view, and there's also a stuffed mouse. But the stuffed mouse is occluded. You can't see. The director can't see that. And so as a result of that, you know that it must be the computer mouse. But you need to take a minute to realize that that's true. OK, so we look at your eye movements, and we look at where you look. And what we find is that if we look at uh, situations in which your perspective is the same as the director's, that is the control line that you see there on the top, that is showing you the time course of everything unfolding and where you look. And basically what you do is you start by looking at the target, and then you choose the correct thing when your perspectives are the same. No surprises there. But now, when your perspective is different from the other person's, notice that what happens there is I look at the wrong thing. The thing from my perspective is what I think it should be. Then I look at the right thing, and then I select the correct thing. But as a result of that, I've taken an extra two, uh, second and a half to make my selections. OK, so what does this show us? It shows us that when we attempt to understand someone's perspective, we egocentrically anchor on our own perspective, and then we adjust or correct for this fact, and this slows us down as a result. That's, uh, it becomes harder for us to be able to do that. OK, so this has led to a kind of theory of uh, perspective taking called egocentric anchoring and adjustment, which says that the way that we do this is we start by automatically starting where we are, and then we effortfully correct for it, but we only do that serially and uh, subsequently and effortfully. OK, what does all of this mean for us when it comes to empathy? Well, now what we want to try to understand is exactly how much are people anchoring on their egocentric perspective? How much are they using themselves as a way to try to understand what the other person must be feeling? And how much are they correcting for that influence? And so what we did is we just did another version of the study um, and basically, all that we did here is we, we did the same setup that you've seen now several times, but we additionally had a set of questions where we said, tell us how you would feel. Tell us if you were asked to complete this interview, how jittery do you think you would be? How anxious do you think you would be? How um, interested or engaged do you think you would be? Um, and then what we did is we compared their answers to the questions for themselves to what they said they thought the other person would experience. And we use the same strategy that you've already seen. We just take different scores between those. 
So if you said that you thought that you would feel two on jittery, and you thought the other person would be three, then you've engaged in one unit of correction from your own perspective. And so we can do that across all of these 20 items, and then we can see how much does self-correction, A, predict your accuracy levels, and also how are your tendencies towards empathizing in certain ways related to how much you correct. And so a different score is what we use to capture that kind of extent of or um, amount of self-projection. Okay, and so uh, what happens in this study is if we look uh, at the levels of contagion or concern along the x-axis there, and we look at how much they correct from their perspective to give a different answer for the other person, what you'll see there is that the patterns are opposing. They have this kind of crisscross-like setup. So if you look at the blue dots and the blue line, that's capturing the levels of contagion. As you have increasing levels of contagion, notice that what happens is you correct less. You're less inclined to adjust from your own perspective relative to the other person. But as you have higher and higher levels of concern, that's the teal, notice that that increases your levels of correction. You're more inclined to adjust from your own perspective relative to the other person. And on the right-hand side, importantly, it turns out that the number of units of correction that you have from your own perspective predicts your levels of accuracy. What that tells us is that your ideas about how you would feel are in fact different from the other person's. The more that you adjust from those perspectives, the more likely you are to get it right. And so you see this positive relationship between how much you correct and also how much um, accuracy you exhibit on the task. Okay, so that sort of gives us two answers to this question. One of them is that it's related to the kinds of decision-making styles that people adopt. But also, if we dig into the cognitive mechanics about how they're doing the, the, the task, we see that those also differ. It's about whether you adjust from or correct for your own perspective and whatever biases might emerge in it when you're trying to predict the other person. Okay, so a quick summary of where we've been. So it looks like different facets of empathy make opposing contributions to people's abilities to read the emotions of somebody else. In past work, these items have often been lumped together in various ways that serve to cancel each other out. But by disentangling them in this way, we can see that there are important, robust, stable contributions of each. This occurs on a whole variety of different interpersonal accuracy measures, each of which have their own problems and biases, but all together tell a story that is very stable and robust, which is that these are strongly related to various ways of trying to get yourself into the emotional shoes of another person. It's not unique to any one facet. It turns out that they're all related in the same ways and show the same stable patterns. And it looks like the decision-making strategies that people use tend to be the reason why we see these differences in accuracy. Okay, so a huge thank you to Ananya and Issa for all of the work that they put into this project. And also a huge thank you to the Implicit Cognition and Evaluation, or ICE Lab, uh, for everything they've done since. So thank you so much for coming. I believe we have time for some questions, if you have any questions. There's a mic runner who will be happy to pass you a mic. Yeah, to make it a bit more complicated, there's a lot of data that it, right hemisphere functions have a lot to do with this. So we've studied people with right hemisphere strokes, and some of uh, them can't deliver or can't uh, actually convey either the terms of use have been prosody, facial expressions and body language. Yeah. And then there's others who can't pick it up on others. So this can be tested. So the anatomy of it, and some people congenitally are much more apt to pick up body language and other things than others. Yeah. So I think the hemispheral brain part of it is also a part of this. So in some people, there's a real mismatch between what they feel and how they're able to get it across. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, we haven't we haven't looked at any of the neural substrates of this, of course. Um, it's interesting because I think that there are some questions about exactly what people are doing to solve these tasks, right? So when you think about um, doing something like the static image version of the task, right? You're trying to read a person's facial expression. 
whatever strategies you're using there are probably different from the ones that happen in the interview paradigm, right? Where you're looking for some sort of nonverbal cues, or maybe they say something, or maybe there's something in the, uh, the, the sort of inflection of their voice or what have you uh, that you're relying upon. But I think there's lots of work to be done there on the mechanics of it. I'm just thinking about exactly how that's unfolding and what exactly people are doing to try to, to, to sort of come to this judgment. Yeah, I love that. Were each of the tests that you use uh, done with video or live? Uh, so for the interview paradigm, uh, those are recordings. Uh, in fact, they look exactly like the one you saw because we recorded that in the same space. Uh, so the, the interview initially took place live with a research assistant who was asking the questions sort of off camera. And then the person answers them over the course of approximately three minutes or so. And then we drew out a segment of that that did not include the experimenter that was used as the clip that participants judged. Do you perceive that there might be a difference uh, if the interviews were done by recording versus uh, live and the res uh, response versus contagion? And, um, yeah. And I ask that because in, in terms of perceptions of uh, response of people being recorded, there's a significant difference of whether they're being recorded or whether uh, they're, they're in yeah. a live situation. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, you could imagine that on both sides of the equation, right? So you have different emotional reactions given the fact that you're being recorded. And not to mention you're in a psych study and you're being brought in and asked these questions about yourself and you're answering them and know that this tape will be used for something else. So that's clearly gonna change the emotional experiences of the target, right? And then also the question of the perceiver, right? So there's a question about whether being in the room has some sort of role to play for how you do the task, but also how well you do the task in terms of answering these questions. Yeah, so the paradigm that you saw is based on some earlier research, uh, and they executed their study live. So they had two participants come into the lab, they executed this paradigm, one of them answered how they felt, the other one had to guess how they felt. And then they look at the relationship between that and things like rationality and intuition and all of those sorts of things. Uh, this was only meant as a sort of attempt at convenience because we wanted to be able to get a much larger sample than the Williams subject pool can often offer. Um, and so that was part of what motivated us to do it. But I recognize that there are like a, a lot of differences or limitations that emerge as a result of that. Um, the thing that's most striking to me, though, at least, is just the fact that you get what you would, exactly what you would predict the opposing patterns would be in the opposite direction because the measure is error relative to all of those other interpersonal accuracy measures that we collected. So I think it gives us some pretty good, robust evidence that whatever it is that people are doing there is probably related to the same things that they're engaging in with the reading the mind and the eyes test and all those other sorts of things. But no, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very fair point. Are you thinking of these abilities for empathy to be aspects of personality, therefore maybe not changeable over the, a lifespan? Or possibly if you tested these Williams undergrads in five years, life experience yeah. could possibly affect their capacities in different ways. Yeah, I love that question, yeah. In fact, uh, there is some, so, so a couple of things. One thing is that there is some pretty good research that suggests that these are quite stable. Uh, so where we sit on these measurements tends to be something that if we were to measure it, you know, years from now, we would probably get approximately similar sorts of values. But one of the most exciting avenues of research right now is uh, trying to cultivate ways of changing, especially things like, um, sort of empathic concern and the reactions that you have towards somebody else. Um, and so one of the things that turns out to be really interesting is that mindfulness meditation seems to be related. So if you have people do the reading the mind and the eyes test, and then you give them six weeks of mindfulness meditation, um, and then you have them do the reading the mind and the eyes test again, their scores improve. Um, so at the level of interpersonal accuracy. And part of that is related to changes in their empathic responding.
Um, so it, it does seem like it's malleable in some way. It's just very, it's, it's quite stable in a lot of ways. So th then the question becomes like, how do you change it, right? Like what are the things that would cause somebody to have different reactions? And I think that's a, a very much an open question. There's still a lot of work to be done there. Thank you very much for this talk. I, I'm curious if in any related research you've seen uh, a connection between the ability of someone who has a high degree of empathy, whether it's measured in terms of contagion or empathic concern, uh, uh, and with the ability to uh, detect narcissism. Since uh, I, I've heard oh. that uh, n narcissists often uh, seek out people who have high degrees of empathy. That's, uh, that's a really interesting question. I don't know of any work along those lines, nor have we done any work related to that. We, we started to branch out a little bit into thinking about other kinds of judgment tasks, though, um, of which that seems like a very interesting one, just, just the question about whether there are cues that you can detect that would allow you to have an accurate window into this or not. Um, but nothing that we've done that we've done more generally, no. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, the question relates a little bit to some work that I'm doing, and I wonder if you could extrapolate um, I probably haven't done this research, but any sort of thought about how <clears throat> these differential, I don't know what to call them, personality types or, or approaches to empathy and, and, and contagion would relate to whether people are susceptible to misinformation or not, given that oh. what is the rationality. <laughs> Wait, what's your prediction? <laughs> well, I, I've got a pretty, I mean, it seems obvious, but I don't know. And it also, do you have any data about across the population? how this spreads out in terms of where yeah. people are? We're getting a little out of my wheelhouse, but there is some work on um, the relationship between susceptibility to things like fake news and uh, tendencies towards intuitive versus rational decision making. My understanding is that the patterns there are more complicated than you would imagine. Um, although there has been some evidence that suggests that maybe, part, maybe rationality is part of the story there, but I think there's, there's a number of wrinkles to that that I, don't, I can't fully piece together right now. But the, the thing that I'm especially excited about with this work is that because we've shown these patterns with decision-making style, there's a very robust literature about these decision-making styles and the various connections that they have to all kinds of different um, uh, sort of psychological tendencies. Um, and near as I can tell, there hasn't been any work that's found this robust relationship or this systematic relationship with empathy. And so that should make a series of really important predictions about how people resolve these kinds of um, sort of judgment sorts of tasks. So one of the things that we got especially interested in is uh, morality more generally. Um, so morality has a very well developed, moral judgment has a very well developed literature on the extent to which rational versus intuitive decision making has a role to play there. Um, and so there's, it seems to me that there's probably going to be a connection with how you empathize with people as well and its connection in, in that sort of way. Nothing about inf misinformation that I know of though. So I think the the, the more general question would be, um, if, if there is a connection there, is it because of the dis decision-making styles, or is there some other reason that you could imagine that the way that you empathize with other people is related to how susceptible you are to the information that that person is telling you, for example? Yeah. As I listen to you, it comes to mind that um, uh, intuition is something that people think they have or they don't have, whereas rationality seems to be a skill that one can be taught. Mm. Is that part of this equation or not necessarily? Oh, that, yeah, that's, it's, it's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in a lot of ways, you can think of college as essentially trying to train those rational faculties in a lot of ways, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting because the measurement, the, the rational experiential inventory, um, I glossed over a few of these details, but it has two different subcomponents. One of them is a preference for using rationality versus intuitive sorts of judgments. And one of them is a belief that it is useful or not. So there's sort of these two different subscales that are related. And 
they've shown that they kind of lump together sometimes, but they can be separated and have different contributions in some cases, for example. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know the extent to which we should imagine that those should change over time necessarily, uh, or if there's some sort of training that's involved in sort of, like I guess the question would be, like why, why does a person get to a place where they think that intuition is valuable or not? Is that because their intuition has benefited them in the past and they, so they say this is a strategy that I think is useful or are there other sorts of theories or beliefs that they have about that? And similarly with rationality, what is it that makes you think it is a good or a not so good reliable guide? Um, but I don't think we know, we know the nuances of that just yet, yeah. Um, uh, there was a study done about 10 years ago in, in which a doctor actually, actually, you know, at the Mass General Hospital uh, took residents and uh, tried to teach empathy by doing a double-blind study in, in which half the people looked at people's faces and they were uh, taught how to interpret them hmm. and then the other group just did something else. And then they, following that, they had patients grade the doctors, whether they were empathetic and kind and mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. And the data, although it wasn't greatly robust, tended to indicate that those that had this facial training uh, came across better to their patients. And I wondered, huh. and they started a company and they, feel that they can teach empathy. I wonder what your thoughts are of that. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm actually really curious to know what the training is, like what the cues are that they're, that they're helping people to sort of pay attention to or latch on to. It calls to mind this work by um, Ekman. He did a whole, he did this really, really um, uh, robust series of studies over a very long period of time where he was essentially trying to code the activation of various facial muscles and the ways that those are related to different kinds of emotional expressions. And there's a training that you can do where he teaches you exactly which muscles get activated when you experience sadness. Um, and sort of learning to pay attention to those cues can help you to be a kind of a much better reader of a person's emotional experience in some ways. Um, it's interesting to, uh, to imagine what training more generally would look like, though, when you're thinking about like, the domain specificity of this versus the domain generality of it. I think, again, one of the things that really strikes me about this is that it's happening with facial expressions, but also video, like with, with people interacting in nonverbal ways on just sitting there on a couch, with audio clips, all of these various things. And so the, all of those require probably different skills to be able to particularly read out and grab on to the things that you think are actually related to their emotional experience. So getting training in one of those may not necessarily bleed over into other things. But I think the question, I think this is one of the key questions right now though, is exactly what does that empathic training sort of look like to foster a kind of emotional intelligence and to allow you to get a better read on another person's experiences. Thanks very much. <laughs> and your question about the training of physicians has led me to wonder about cross-cultural mm. interpretations because there is a school in anthropology of culture and personality yeah. issues. And I wonder if that has been part of your analysis as well. That is to say, someone may think they're empathetic if they, at a certain point, um, feel that the person is uh, with them or not. Right. They may respond with anger or not. And maybe anger is an appropriate response in some situations, but, and it would be then empathetic. And other persons may respond with anger and it is the reverse. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at whether you could think cross-culturally about this and say something about that because it would help us in a, uh, I would say, a world of contention a world filled yeah. with uh, m misunderstanding and perhaps a kind of uh, polarization which concerns many of us deeply. 
how yeah. to r get across those boundaries in a thoughtful way. Right. Yeah, we, the, the short answer is we haven't done anything cross-culturally, but I totally agree that there are some really interesting questions to ask um, about that, partly because there's been a very well-developed literature in, on emotion, both the universal sort of elements of emotional expression as well as its cultural modifiers. Um, and so cultural norms surrounding when we should mask our expressions, what kinds of interactions we're supposed to have with others, when it's appropriate to express certain kinds of emotional experiences. Um, and so you, you have to imagine that there's going to be a huge amount of cultural variability, both in terms of what the target is doing and what the perceiver is doing to try to read those emotions, as well as whether we have the correct theories about those things as a result of cultural barriers. Um, but we haven't done any of that work yet. I think there's a lot of really interesting questions to ask there, though. Yeah. Uh, hi, I um, found it uh, very interesting because empathy is very close to morality. Morality is kind of important for um, social um, yeah. uh, things. Um, I might uh, po uh, uh, poke on the issue of um, coming out of the idea of the, this uh, uh, two brain uh, theories that have been developed that I'm, I've been finding very interesting. Different uh, ways of processing from uh, uh, right hemisphere, less left uh, hemisphere. Um, you continually use the word rationality versus intuition. Yeah. That may be a misstatement of the reality. It may be that intuition is, is mental processing at a much higher speed than rational thought, which goes through more uh, quickly. Um, uh, very fast uh, processing is more um, common on the um, left side of the brain, uh, more thoughtful, um, interpersonal, considering different perspectives. Uh, of the um, uh, right side of the brain takes longer. Um, might that be part of it, uh, that um, maybe it's worth considering, uh, uh, rather than using a vague term of intuition to say this is a, uh, coming to conclusions much, much faster in their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, like, like raw like speed that. of the choice. I'm sorry? The, like the raw speed with which they make their choices, right. for example? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically, if you can make the choice very quickly, you can move on to something else. It may be totally wrong, but it's been useful in the past, so you use that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very quick and easy way to reach a completely immoral end, but you, it sounds <laughs> rational because it's right. what you've done all the time. Yeah, I, I think your, your thinking is definitely headed down the same path as ours was. Uh, so we, we tried to look, for example, at how quickly they made their choices um, and whether that was related to their accuracy. It turned out that wasn't, um, and we were somewhat surprised by that because we thought that that should be probably part of the story. And you should also imagine that whether you're intuitive versus rational is also probably going to be related to just the general speed with which you're doing the survey. That also turned out to not be true. Um, so I think part of the, there's still a lot more to unpack here probably. But I think we're, we're, and of course, we still haven't provided all of the evidence that's necessary to support this view. But we do want to try to make a claim that what the intuition is providing to you is too inappropriately colored by your own ideas about what you would experience. And to the extent that you face a situation where you, someone else is different from you, what rationality is doing is it's pulling you more towards them, whatever that looks like. Um, so whether that's fast or slow, it's unclear. But we would probably argue that the, the sort of like self-determination of that probably is fast, right? Like how you, f how you think you would feel is probably coming to you in an instant kind of thing. Also, um, if I might, um, you mentioned that uh, you've gotten different results if you ask for uh, go, people to go through a period of mindfulness before they um, talk. I would suggest that it's absolutely critical to see that the basic terrain, the endocrinological ter uh, terrain needs to be kept in, in uh, kept in mind at all times. I don't think it's been, I don't think the theory has been developed right, uh, has been developed fully, but I think it may be that the different um, hemispheres of the brain stimulate the hor uh, hormones slightly uh, differently. So when you're in more of a, of a um, left brain way of thinking, you've stimulated the adrenalines to get what is needed done, done now and move on. Mm -hmm. um, and you've helped shut down some of the more um, the serotonin and calming type things. So I think uh, 
to understand that that is actually setting a ground of reality, the interaction between the various hormonal systems, yeah. the more thoughtful versus the more active. Um, in my work, I've been dealing with some very serious um, sociopathic and manic and narcissistic people who do um, unconscionable things, um, claiming to be kind. So I'm, mm. I've been seeing the, the worst side of humanity coming out. Right. And I think the best way to understand it is actually in the hormonal um, elements of it, because yeah. that's how it, um, as Aristotle would say, that's the material cause of these things. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the, that particular study did not do any work to try to understand what was changing or why. Uh, they just find this pre-post sort of change as a result of the mindfulness meditation exposure. But I think you're right that there's probably, I mean, the, the, the key question, right, is understanding how much of this can be changed physiologically versus how much of this is a change in sort of mindset, attention, decision-making strategies, whatever that looks like. Um, and to the extent that you see empathy as this kind of automatic physiological reaction, that seems hard to train, right? That's something that's probably going to be a lot more stable uh, relative to something like attention or training along the lines of here's where you should look at the face. And if you read these particular muscle activations, you can get a better understanding sort of thing. But yeah, no, there's, there's still a lot of work to do there for sure. Well, thank you so much, you. Jeremy, Professor Cohn. We've reached the end of our time today uh, for this talk.